Now, we didn't vote for a new flag when we had the chance. Do we have the appetite for a new constitution? Well, former Prime Minister and lawyer Sir Geoffrey Palmer and his colleague Dr Andrew Butler say we need one, whether we know it or not, because the current one is a bit of a mess. In fact, almost no one in New Zealand could track down all of it or much, much less form an opinion on changing it. And in their new book, they've written down a draft constitution themselves to identify, in their words, the bedrock principles by which public power should be exercised in New Zealand. They hope it'll kickstart a discussion about this, which will lead to something like it being put in place. And they're right here in the studio with me now, so I can kickstart them into a discussion about it right here. Um, now, so Geoffrey, we all know who you are. You're a very prominent public figure in New Zealand. Andrew Butler, sorry to have to be the one to tell you, slightly less famous. <laughs> um, so uh, can you tell us about your interest in this subject. Sure. Hi, uh, Colin, and thanks again for the opportunity to come in this morning. Yes, yeah, so as you can probably tell from my accent, I wasn't exactly born up the road in uh, Lower Hutt. Yeah, so you're not from around these I'm parts. I'm not from around these parts, exactly, although I've been here now 25 years, so I'm beginning to feel I'm, a, I'm definitely a, a Kiwi, a New Zealander. So yeah, I was born in Dublin and studied law in Dublin. Uh, an area that I was particularly interested in was constitutional law, uh, and I took my studies away off to Toronto, where I studied more constitutional law, and then subsequently uh, to Florence in Italy where uh, in between drinking cappuccinos and what have you, I did manage to slot in the odd lecture or two <laughs> on constitutional law. Excellent. Now, um, we've never had a crisis to force this issue. That's mentioned in the book. Now, there was a so-called constitutional crisis way back in 1984, I think, and Sir Geoffrey, you will remember that because, if you were, of course, it was part of the handover to uh, your Labour government a at the time. Was that actually relevant? Was that a little warning from history of the things that can go wrong if we don't have something formal and written down in, in the unitary sense you're suggesting? It was a very serious matter. Uh, and if Jim McClay hadn't uh, invented a new constitutional convention that we hitherto had never seen, there would not have been a peaceful changeover. I had secured a legal opinion that said that w the Governor-General could actually dismiss the government. It was all about the devaluation crisis. Uh, and Sir Robert would not devalue. The incoming government wanted to devalue. This is, this is having lost the election. Yes, yeah. having lost the election. You couldn't swear in a new government. We had to change the law about that. Uh, and indeed, at the same time, we got the Constitution Act 1986, which set out our constitutional principles in a rather better form than they existed under the old 1852 Act, the remnants of which were still the law. Right. So, so Sounds as though it will be out of date if it dates back to 1852. <laughs> well, exactly. And, and uh, the, the thing was that in this constitution that we're promoting, the Constitution Act is there. Okay. Well, I mean, other than strange events like that one back in 1984, you also mentioned very few countries don't operate without the kind of written down constitution in one place. There are a couple, Israel and the United Kingdom. Now, I, I guess the politics in both those places can be a little volatile. As far as I'm aware, though, their democratic systems are, broadly speaking, stable. I mean, is the fact that we're a bit of an outlier and not having one, does it necessarily mean we need one? Uh, I think it does, but opinions will differ about that. The difficulty in the United Kingdom is they're progressing to a form of federalism. They're backing into it. They've got separate parliaments in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. They're into about their third and fourth lot of devolution. It is becoming very unsatisfactory, especially with Brexit, which, as one commentator in Britain said, was the biggest failure of British statecraft since Lord North lost the American colonies. Uh, the, the British model isn't looking too healthy. And just remember this, that we don't have any federalism here and we are not promoting it. One of the biggest complexities in constitutional systems is where you have federalism. Australia and the United States have it. We don't. We don't want it. OK. Well, I mean, we do, do though, have uh, the Bill of Rights Act of 1990, which, of course, would have um, gone through under your watch uh, when you were in government, uh, Sir Geoffrey. Uh, the Constitution Act of 1986 as well. But you were saying, um, Andrew, both these could be um, amended under a single sitting of Parliament with no public input under urgency. I wasn't aware of that. Yep, uh, that's absolutely right. <coughs> but is, it, is that really likely to happen? So look, um, is it likely to happen? Uh, who knows? We don't know until a constitutional crisis of some sort comes along. If you'd gone back and asked in 1981, would it be possible that a prime minister who'd been booted out at election would refuse to do that which was required by the incoming government? In 1984. In yes. 1984, everybody would have laughed at the proposition because the understanding of the convention 
was so widely shared that everybody's expectation was that people would act in accordance with the convention. And our whole argument is, well, look, relying on conventions um, is relying an awful lot on people behaving in a, in a particular way. Why not set down the rules if we're all comfortable that those conventions are indeed the correct conventions? In one sense, where's the harm in writing it down and making sure that we've written down in the one place what it is that we've agreed to? So coming back then to the specific point you've raised about the Constitution Act and the Bill of Rights Act, in the book we give an example of something that actually happened here in 2013. So there was uh, some litigation that actually got covered quite extensively by Radio New Zealand, which concerned a, a policy that was in place by the Ministry of Health, under which if you were the parent of a, an adult disabled child, you could not be and would not be paid for the care that you gave to that uh, child of yours. Yes, unlike. and this could be overnight hours and all of that sort exactly of thing. Right. It went through Parliament, was never so, put in place. So, so, and so what was, what was found in that particular case by the Human Rights Review Tribunal, by the High Court and the Court of Appeal, was that that policy of the ministries was uh, discrimin discriminatory and not able to be justified in a free and democratic society, which is the test that gets applied under the Bill of Rights. All right. So, so couldn't so, have happened, do you think, if we were living under the kind of constitution well, you're well, proposing? Well, here's, here's the kicker. What actually did end up happening was that was a policy, so it wasn't protected by the statute so that's so the ministry was exposed as a result of that policy not being in a statute mm. so what then ended up happening was the parliament passed under urgency in one sitting day no select committee no consultation in advance to let people know that this bill was coming on a matter of confidence and supply so budget night rushed through this legislation effectively to making sure that no person so putting through a new policy and saying that that new policy could never be challenged in court by way of a judicial review, could never be the subject of a complaint to the Human Rights Commission, could never be challenged, in other words, mm -hmm. for not being in accordance with the rights that every other New Zealander has and can use to test government and test the quality of legislation. That all happened in one sitting day. OK. Well, we will turn very shortly to the specifics of what you are proposing in this constitution for Aotearoa New Zealand. But um, you did also say in the book, and as you co-wrote it, I'm assuming you share this opinion, uh, mm -hmm. but this new uh, constitution has the capacity to restore some trust in politics and politicians, the loss of which is afflicting many Western governments. Uh, so, Geoffrey, really, how would it help? Uh, well, the Institute for Governance and Policy Studies at Victoria University in March 2016 published a report that said 61% of New Zealanders expressed that they didn't have much trust in government and 39% had a reasonable trust in it. Now, if you look at the composition of the New Zealand population, you find that 25% of the people who are living in New Zealand were born overseas. If you look at that figure in Auckland, you find that nearly 40% of Auckland residents were born overseas. That is a picture, I put it to you, of real diversity. Uh, and 30% of Aucklanders speak more than one language. Now, and by 2038, Statistics New Zealand projects that Asians in New Zealand will outnumber Maori. Now, given all of that, you can't expect people who come here when they come from another country and don't know our traditions, they're not written down, they can't be found, they're in many different sources. It's very hard to educate people about them. What you need above anything else, and this is the prime message of this whole enterprise, is that you write the rules down okay, so that everyone can see what they are and sing from the same songbook. So operating without a sort of unitary constitution so far, you think it's been upheld by a mixture of convention and also kind of consensus. Do you think this changing ethnic composition of New Zealand actually threatens that kind of consensus? That I think it does. I think when I grew up uh, in Nelson many, many years ago, everyone knew what the rules were. You didn't have to have any... It was The social consensus was so great. The diversity was much less. The diversity of New Zealand has been astonishing in its rapid development. That diversity bring challenges. It brings challenges with it. We have to have a set of rules that everyone can understand and they're educated about. Though surely foreign-born people who come to live here in New Zealand are coming here for a reason, and one of those reasons would be the, the values and systems and the way we operate and live our lives. I understand that. 
Uh, and it's very important, though, that those be preserved against future challenges. And this is a forward-looking project. We are saying that New Zealand has done well as a nation. We have been governed relatively well as a nation, no question. No, you do uh, say so yourself. Yeah, well, well I don't... I, I'm not, well, all I'm saying is that, that we need to preserve that which is best in our whole constitutional history, and there's a lot of that, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to ensure, uh, insulate it against the challenges that are coming in the future. There will be a lot of them. Climate change is going to be very disruptive for, in, around the world. We've got geopolitical problems that you can see in the Middle East and a lot of instability about that. There are all sorts of problems of mass immigration that are causing problems around the world. We need to have our democracy in the best shape, the most robust shape and the clearest shape that it can be in order to meet those future challenges. Right, well let's get down to the nuts and bolts of what is proposed in your constitution, constitution for Aotearoa New Zealand. First of all, uh, this involves taking that leap and becoming a republic, which you seem to say will be uncontroversial. Andrew Butler, you reckon? Yeah, so look, the reality, Colin, is that we're already living in what some commentators have described as a disguised republic. Um, if you look at it while we've got a form which involves a monarchy, the reality is that the person who is our monarch is not somebody who is present in our lives on a regular basis. Um, and that's not said in any bad pejorative way, it's just the, the truth of the matter. I think she was the first, the, the current Queen was the first monarch to ever visit <coughs> New Zealand while, while in, in situ. Mm -hmm. and she's been down here about nine, ten times across uh, the length in, uh, of, her, of her reign. Um, but the reality is, is that New Zealand is run by New Zealanders. The reality now is that the Governor General is a New Zealander. Uh, and when you stand back and think about, well, why would we want to continue with a monarchy? It seems um, that a monarchy sends forward images about New Zealanders that actually jar with our own self-image. So if They line up to see Prince William and <coughs> Kate when they came on tour? Well, they not, didn't not, for not, Charles. In, not in vast numbers, okay. um, but you know, and again, it's not really about a popularity contest. It's really, from our perspective, if you think about what Jeffrey was talking about, the future proofing of our of our system going forward, and um, you know, what is it that it means to be a New Zealander? And one of those is um, it's a meritocracy, so people get to where they the positions they occupy largely based on merit. And they certainly don't get to where they are simply by dint of the family they happen to be born into. Mm. You know, so and, and you both made the point that our political leaders, um, three or four back, they've all been saying, look, it's inevitable sooner exactly. or later, we'll become a republic. But this does involve, doesn't it, Sir Geoffrey, choosing a head of state, and that could be controversial. Well, it can be, but it's been controversial in the past already, choosing a Governor-General. I remember when Sir Keith Holyoke, who was a Member of Parliament and a Minister, became the, the Governor-General. That was very controversial. Uh, I think it's really important to understand that what we are doing here is making it clear what the head of state can do, what the functions of the head of state are, and the whole thing is not shrouded in mystery. Our constitution in New Zealand is very mysterious. It's <laughs> extremely hard to teach to students, and it's very difficult for people to understand how the crown works. Mm. When you deconstruct the crown, it all becomes much simpler. But for a head of state, you're talking about similar powers to a governor general, I think, um, but elected by the House of Representatives yes. and for a five-year term. Yes. Okay. Now, I just it makes me think back to I was living in the UK when, uh, after Princess... Diana died. Mm. Strong anti-royal feeling in the wake of that, the way that was handled. Newspapers pushed it. There were polls and uh, debates. Is it time to ditch the monarchy? And at that time, one major, major nationwide poll said, if you were to choose a head of state, who would it be? The person who was selected by far and away by some margin was Sir Richard Branson. Now, there's no way I don't think that the British Parliament would have elected a tycoon like that as the head of state too divisive. But... Um, it, it wouldn't be a simple thing to elect a figure that people could get behind, particularly no, the first but, time around. but the biggest argument uh, has been the one that they had in Australia when they failed to get a republic because the people who favoured a republic were split between those who favoured an elected person mm -hmm. and those who favoured someone appointed by Parliament. <clears throat> we think that it is a mistake to elect the head of state because then that person will have to be given some substantial powers 
Furthermore... You mean a public vote would be a mistake? Yes, a public vote and an election, and it'll become the subject of party political capture. That is not a sound thing either. You want your head of state to be beyond political uh, partisanship. But if it's that, elected by your MPs, it could be a political... Well, well I think if it's, it's not a government appointment, the free vote is the critical factor here. The party whips are not operating. They cannot operate on a free vote. And, and therefore, it, it, the government must have a role in this. The government certainly can propose people, but so can others. And, and the parliament needs to be the central democratic institution that determines this question. That is our view, because if you have an election, you are going to get a whole lot of discussion which will not be about the central political issues that you want elections to be about. OK. Now, another innovation in your constitution, a four-year term of parliament as opposed to three at the current time. Why would that be? Uh, I think that the lawmaking process in the New Zealand parliament is impeded by the three-year term. That is because often legislation has to be designed. It takes a longer time to design it and a long time to draft it. And the three-year term means that politicians have to get runs on the board legislatively. Often the law is not sufficiently considered. This constitution has more checks and balances in it than our existing constitution. It is therefore safe to extend it to a four-year term so that the legislation may be better made by Parliament. There are some very grave difficulties in our legislative process as matters stand. And I suppose in the last year of a three-year term, nowadays they're into almost electioneering mode right from the start of the yes, year. Yes, and, and, election, <laughs> and elections, the thing about elections that you have to remember is that they're a generalised judgement mm. about how a government's performed. They're not about detailed provisions. And the democratic process has to act on detailed provisions and proposals and scrutiny of those proposals and getting them right so they'll work. We've got a massive amount of law in New Zealand, 65,000 pages of statute law, and a lot of it is not fit for purpose. We have to do better because things are getting much more complicated than they used to be. Well, um, in the UK and I think in the Republic of Ireland as well, it's a five-year parliamentary term, Andrew Butler. Um, no consideration given to throwing it out another two years and giving... Um, government's a longer time to... No, we actually did think about a, a pushing it out to a five-year term, but we kind of thought if you're moving from a... <coughs> excuse me, from you moving from a three-year norm to something longer than that, four years seemed about right. And actually, in practice, the reality is in both Ireland and in the UK, you often end up with a parliament that actually only lasts around four years. And they call the earlier one call when they think they come exactly. in. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. OK, well, look, another thing is um, one aspect of it's not radical in a sense what you're proposing. Things like remaining in the Commonwealth, that's still uh, a part of the recipe, and, and also embedding the Treaty of Waitangi in its place that already it overlaps with a number of other laws and conventions. But, um, I mean, there will be Sir Geoffrey uh, Māori who don't favour that. There are some, so some who will say, look, sovereignty wasn't ceded. It would be better to start from the ground up. Um, maybe even some Māori constitutional lawyers feel this way. And I don't think that you've mentioned that you haven't really consulted in the book uh, before drafting this proposal. We have mentioned it. And indeed, there is a profound report from Māori constitutional lawyers that was made public at Waitangi last year that we have looked at and considered and what we have said about that is there does need, if these proposals get life, and after a year we have uh, refined them, if they get life, there has to be a profound conversation with Māori about them, as was recommended by the Royal Commission on Electoral Law way back in 1986, but it's never taken place. Uh, and and they, the report that they did is a really interesting report. Uh, and uh, we think that it's very important for those dialogues to happen because one of the things about Māori you have to remember is that the treaty, uh, when we dated it back to 1840 in, in the 1980s, that was very unpopular. But we've now had more than 25 years of that. We've had a lot of uh, attention to settlements of these things it is clear that the treaty is a central part of the workings of the New Zealand government and that ought to be recognised and made certain. It is, at the moment, very untidy.
Okay. Well, another thing that's of specific interest, I guess, um, to me, uh, the program Media Watch, a common theme uh, that we've had all this year, the Official Information Act, journalists and also members of the public, of course, trying to get at uh, official information which really ought to be public and a feeling, a feeling that there's a lot of obstruction on this. Now, you are proposing uh, an information authority which would be um, independent, have oversight and also it sounds like the powers to actually compel the government or even local government uh, to release information when uh, there's no good reason not to? We've had the Official Information Act since 1982. Unfortunately, it still remains very unpopular with many of the people within the government system. It's, it, the way in which it is honoured is extremely inconsistent. It was very good at the beginning when it was the biggest game in town and there was a lot of training in central government about how it should work. But the difficulty with it is that the Law Commission examined it some years ago and made a series of recommendations about how it should be brought up to date, hasn't been really looked at since it was enacted properly. Those recommendations, for the most part, were ignored by the government. Then we had the report of the Chief Ombudsman about the Official Information Act, uh, and that was heavily criticised by journalists because it made the a number of uh, administrative changes. The truth of the matter is, if we don't know how this Act should work after we've had it since 1982, we are not up to the job. We need to have no more ministerial control over this. It seems to me we need to have hard decisions made that are, that are concrete, not merely recommendations from the Ombudsman. I would therefore take the jurisdiction away from the Ombudsman because they've got a very important jurisdiction about maladministration, which to some degree over the years has been swamped by the official information work that they do. Uh, and I take the view that the original function they had is vitally important and needs to be nourished. So uh, that is what we are proposing. It'll be interesting to see what people think about it. So it's, it's an authority that would take away, that would take the place of the Ombudsman. You say here, removing the Cabinet veto on releasing yes. information and producing uh, certain unpredictable guidelines and allowing for appeal to the courts on yes. points of law. Yes, because obviously when we started this off way back then, it was an experiment. We were very early uh, uptakers mm. of this idea in the Western world. Uh, we did very well. A lot of people came and studied it. But actually, we've lost our way a bit on it now. OK, now this does involve also uh, it's several uh, points in the book. You get the message that we're almost doing away with the term of the crown, replacing it with the state. Now, is that just swapping one term for another, Andrew Butler? Uh, is it interchangeable terms? Um, <clears throat> for some purposes, yes, and for some purposes, no. So one of the points I think that Geoffrey made earlier in the interview was that if you deconstruct the crown, and so take away all of the various jobs that the Crown appears to do in many different guises, actually seeing how the whole apparatus of government works is a lot easier and much more straightforward. So that's why we've gone ahead with the idea of saying, right, well, we, if we're going to move to a republic, you can't refer to the Crown anymore in any event. That doesn't make sense. So what would you replace it with? You'd replace it with a much more straightforward concept of the state. And in most overseas jurisdictions that are republics, what you just simply have is you refer to the country as the state, and the state has a whole pile of powers that go, uh, that it's able to exercise. But most importantly, in almost all of those uh, constitutions, the fundamental point is made, which is that the state derives all of its powers and its authority from the people. In other words, it's a conversion to a concept of popular sovereignty. And once you do that mind shift and understand that that's what the concept of the state is. The state is the servant of the people. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, it's quite a, a strong uh, sh mental shift uh, that, that, that can change the way in which things get done. And it's also, I suppose, logically consistent if you're becoming a republic and yes. not having a crown. That obviously makes sense. Well, I'm talking to Andrew Butler and Sir Geoffrey Palmer about their book, a Constitution for Aotearoa New Zealand, and we're going through some of the finer points of what's proposed here in what effect, in effect is a draft constitution and something they hope will be adopted or something like it in, in the years ahead. Um, while we're on the subject of state and crown, though, Sir Geoffrey, there is uh, also in your document... Um, a section on assets and liabilities, mm. so effectively the things that belong to... What, what is the constitutional position of, of those? Well, uh, it, it's, it's very important that, that the state inherit 
all the assets and liabilities of the Crown in right of New Zealand because uh, the Crown has a lot of powers. Take the Land Transfer Act, for example. In our system of property law, you get an estate in fee simple, which sounds a strange technical thing, but it means you hold that from the Queen. Now, we've got to make sure that that sort of system isn't upset by this. The land transfer uh, system in New Zealand was one of the earliest reforms in the 1870s and one of the most successful. So what you have to do is to ensure that you're not upsetting that whole concept of estates and land. Now that's just an example of the way you overcome the complexity of the transfer. Uh, and another issue that comes up in relation to that is the treaty. Mm. Uh, the Crown is the treaty partner. What this constitution does to, is to say that the state gets all the powers that the Crown had in relation to the treaty. In this change of management. Yes, mm. and that's all that it is. And that's really the essence of the point, what you just said. Now you've described the uh, adoption of uh, the sort of unitary constitution that's written down, everyone can understand it. New people coming to the country can understand it. It can be taught in schools and so on. Does it actually, does citizenship become a part of this? It, it, does it actually define and determine citizenship? No, it doesn't, because that has to be done by separate law, and citizenship's actually a pretty slippery concept. Well, it's it? a hot topic right now, aren't we? are talking about people coming to the country on visas and uh, basically trying to hop between here and Australia and so on, these it, transitory arrangements, and a, a big issue across the Tasman as well. So this wouldn't be addressed in a constitution. Well, you, you have got... Um, a, a, a statement in here about citizenship, but you haven't got the law defining it because that's done in a separate statute. You can't put every statute in mm. the constitution. Sure. And, and that's really <coughs> the essence of what uh, we are trying to say. We're trying to say you must have law about that, but we're not determining what it is. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, now, you seem to be on the same page about most of these things, I mean, literally, in the form of having co-authored a book that's got both your names on the front cover. What are the things, Andrew Butler, first of all, that you just don't agree on? Yeah, grammar. Or didn't agree on? Grammar. And he likes to start sentences using the word and. I don't. Right. And he won. <laughs> and so that was from some one area of disagreement that, okay. uh, that we had. But was that a deal breaker? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> At one point it nearly was. But yeah. we, we, we got over it. <laughs> Apart from that, though, there must be things that you, you, you had disagreements on. We debated a lot of issues, but... Uh, the, the reason we started this collaboration was I gave a seminar at his law firm about constitutional change in relation to the Bill of Rights where we've got 37 examples over 25 years where the Parliament has deliberately gone against the Bill of Rights and I don't think that's satisfactory. So in the course of that seminar, what uh, what we discussed with each other was that we both thought the same way about it and, and that's why we collaborated and, and it was just one of those happenstance conversations that was quite productive. Okay. Well, you've written the book. It's there. You've made it clear you want this, and you want it to happen as soon as possible. Um, how do you take this beyond this? You want a debate. You, you want it to happen. You've written the book. How do you make sure this doesn't end up remainder in Bennett's bookshop, and that's the end of it? Um, well, we're taking... We've got a, a, a website, and we're into the new media, and Andrew will tell you all about that. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So we've put up all of our proposals on a website, www.constitutionaotearoa.org.nz, uh, for those who are interested. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've made available the primary chapter, the main chapter that sets out the case for what we're proposing in the book. We've also set out the full text of the constitution that we're proposing so that people can see what it looks like. And the reaction so far has been really good, not just from people who are lawyers, but just from people in the general public who say, wow, I now understand what's going on in this area. I didn't realise we had a con we actually had a constitution, didn't realise some of these principles, Colin, that you've talked about, and that you know, the power of parliament and so on. So what we're trying to do is use the website as a way of providing information to people and then we're providing various forms of feedback. So we've got a Facebook page, we've got our we're on Twitter, not yet on Instagram, we'll see whether we're on there, but we've been on Reddit and uh, all sorts of other things that I've been trying to explain to Jeffrey what exactly those are. But more importantly, what we're doing over the next year, what we're doing is we're rolling out a series of fortnightly topics. So we're going to look at individual aspects of how our system works and what we think could usefully change about it on a fortnightly basis, inviting people to comment. 
We've made submission forms available for people to provide us with feedback. What we're going to do is, after about a year or so, we're going to uh, revise the proposals that are set out in the book, put out a new edition, and say what it is that we have learned through the feedback that we've had from, from people. Now, are you concerned, though, about the flag referendum and how that unfolded? Because, well, I mean, there was a lot of engagement in it online, and yet, you know, those meetings, those roadshows were held virtually unattended all around the country. Um, and that was for something a bit more simple, just changing a nation's symbols. And, I mean, the parts of it that seemed to get the greatest detention and uptake were, you know, the novelty elements of designing, designing your own flag, the Kiwi with laser eyes, mm. and so on. You're not concerned about that you might get stuck in the same sort of process with the Constitution? I think we did learn something from the flag referendum, which I thought was a very interesting process. Uh, and what we learned from it was, I think, that it showed a deeper yearning for some constitutional identity of the country to become clearer before you address the question of what symbol you wanted mm. to address that identity. That seems to me to be what the lesson of the flag referendum was. Okay. Well, um, you would like this done as soon as possible. You want, you've got urgency about this. When do you think, realistically, w when will it happen? I think you've got it? to remember the process has to be deliberate. Once we have done in another year what we think is appropriate, it will have to be then put into the processes of the government uh, system. And if it is taken up, there will have to be a big government process about it. There will have to be all sorts of discussions and all sorts of meetings of the sort, for example, that I've already outlined with mm. Māori. Uh, and I think that then uh, it will have to be taken, if it is to be adopted, to a referendum, because there's no other way of giving it democratic legitimacy. Is the agreement and consensus on turning ourselves into a republic a prerequisite though? Can nothing happen before that jump is, is taken? There are a lot of veto points in a, in a constitution like this uh, and, and that is one. But it, it does seem to me, as many of our political leaders have said, although I've never said it, is that a republic is inevitable. Uh, and, and I do think that it is. You don't have to have a republic to have a written constitution, however you can have a written, codified constitution without being a republic. That's the sort of issue that we need to hear about from people. Okay. And, of course, we will need at some point, if this is adopted, a head of state. I guess we're looking for someone, you know, who's been active in public life, someone who's held high office, someone with a good reputation. Um, I think is it that, something that interests you as a job? No, absolutely not. <laughs> no? Uh, I have seen what that office involves, and uh, it is a great deal of work and it is work uh, that is not the sort of work that I would like to do. Really? Lots of overseas travel, visit the Queen? Oh, I've done plenty of that. Thank you. Until we become a Republican. No, you wouldn't be visiting the Queen, of course, but you know. <laughs> right, okay. Well, um, Sir Geoffrey, while you're here, one of the themes we've been looking at on Sunday morning today is uh, the w welfare and rights of our children and young people. Uh, earlier on in the morning, uh, Andrew Beecroft, Children's Commissioner, uh, spoke to us um, and he'd been in Geneva where they've been having this UN review of New Zealand's uh, record under the terms of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, now he was fairly strong, he thinks we're doing some things well and as we should as a developed nation uh, with you know, all the resources and advantages we have to look after people. But he sees real problems, embedded problems and not a joined up cohesive way of dealing with it. I mean do you think that uh, it's really urgent that we do pay attention to these UN processes uh, like this review. I think it is because it's a form of accountability. What it does when New Zealand has signed up to international human rights conventions, it's signed up and ratified seven of them. Mm. And then when we look at whether we've actually implemented them, we find a great deal of this material falls between the cracks. There's been a wonderful recent book published on this by Judy McGregor, Sylvia Bell and Margaret Wilson called Human Rights in New Zealand, Emerging Fault Lines. And what that book tells you is that in relation to the seven major human rights conventions that we have uh, ratified, that our performance in seeing whether we have kept up to them is really uneven, not very systematic, 
and we need to do better. But if you want to really address the specific conditions in New Zealand and make your own priorities as a government or a set of non-government organisations, is you know fronting up to a five-yearly UN review and trying to tick boxes on a 54-article charter to keep them happy, is that really the best way? I mean, we even saw the special rapporteur saying, well, why have you called your ministry the Ministry for Vulnerable Children? What about all children? I mean, surely that's getting sidetracked. Surely the government should have leeway to say, we know our situation, we know what works, we've got to do it urgently, we're going to do it this way, and if it doesn't match, the UN's tick boxes, well, that'd be tough. I think that's rather a superficial view of it, if I may say so. When we uh, ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as we did in 1977, when we came to do the Bill of Rights uh, uh, in 1990, we found, when that was implemented, that, uh, that actually we hadn't changed our laws and ways. I remember a commissioner of police saying to me how much change the police had to make to their practices with the, because of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act. He said it made a, for a better police force to honour the human rights of the people with whom the police dealt. And I think that's true. I think much of that would be true for these other conventions that we have, relatively speaking, not devoted much attention to. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was Sir Geoffrey Palmer and also here with me in the studio, Dr Andrew Butler, and they are the co-authors of A Constitution for Aotearoa New Zealand, published by Victoria University Press. And as we mentioned there, it's all online too, so you can read it and feed back into it. That website again, Andrew Butler? Constitution Aotearoa. Dot org dot nz. Constitution nz. Go and have a look at it. And they do want your feedback for volume two uh, of the book. Thanks so much for joining us.